In this lecture, we are going to review the process associated with creating, implementing, and evaluating the APA training that I put together and that you've now gone through. So going back to the process of program implementation, I did a needs analysis and found there was a need for training in APA formatting. I formulated objectives for the training and then developed the and then developed the program using a slideshow because of the online format of this class. Implementation consisted of me posting the training and you watching and hopefully pausing where needed. Evaluation will be done through the APA training evaluation survey and performance on future assignments. With the survey, I will look at both the ratings you with the survey, I will look at both the ratings you all made and the corrections you made to the sample. And remember the arrows in program implementation? This won't be the end. The larger arrow that goes back to the top is there because I will look again at you as a class and determine where you are with your knowledge and application of APA formatting. This will be another needs analysis. The smaller arrow represents what I will do with this particular training slideshow, making any changes necessary based on your comments or performance for future students. So how did I do my needs analysis? Well, it's pretty basic. I looked at what the job requires. In this case, Part of your assignment grade is having your paper in APA format. I looked at citations, references, using citations correctly, and making sure that you cited all the references that you had on your reference list and vice versa. The way this was graded, there were two full points that was, ex that was the expected performance. I looked at the current knowledge and skills of the students, and what I found was that on average, the students received 1.06 points out of the 2.0 points available. This discrepancy between the requirements and the current knowledge and skills was my indication that there was a need for training. And I want to make a note that this was an informal judgment in this particular case. It's not always the case with a needs analysis, but in this case, that difference between what was actually done and what was expected in terms of the scores was me feeling like it was too big of a difference. And honestly, any amount of difference was too big for me. I really wanted these points on your grade to be freebie points because I had the assumption that you either knew APA formatting or could easily look it up and figure out what to do. So here we are with a need. Now what? In setting objectives for the training, I looked to what the APA criteria of the paper were. The rubric says, References and citations are used appropriately and are in perfect APA format. So goal number one, citations and references are done correctly, both in terms of their format and use. Appropriate, and goal number two, appropriate use and citation of quotes. Objectives changed and grew as I put the training together. I started to figure, if I were going to teach you, I should do it right and include things that others will care about. So goal number two, or this should be goal number three, is basic manuscript characteristics. Font, spacing, margins, title page and abstract, and formatting of headings. And additional pet peeves of mine got included such as the rules for using numbers versus numerals and italicizing statistical abbreviations, such as the R for correlation. And in this numbers 
includes putting a hyphen in written numbers between 31 or 22. I just want to point out that this is not an APA specific rule. This is an English language rule. So then I put the training together. I designed and developed it. Those words may sound formal, but it's the same thing you do when you put together a class presentation. The formal thing that I did do is that I had certain objectives that needed to be met. I tried to make choices that would accomplish those objectives. But really, when you do a class project, you also have objectives. So you basically do the same thing. So one of my questions was, what type of training should I use? I had to make this decision. So I looked at what the options were. I could do a go-to training session, but that would require everyone to meet at the same time, or for me to give the presentation multiple times. I could have just given you a sample manuscript and said this is what it should look like, but that wouldn't have pointed out the things or common mistakes that people make. I could have given you the citation for the APA manual and had you self-study it. Basically, I tried that already on the syllabus, and that didn't work. It must have been too vague. There really is a lot of stuff in the APA manual, and it's hard to focus in on what one particular professor may want. And another option I had was a PowerPoint slide. Given that this is an online class, it seemed logical to use a PowerPoint presentation. Originally, I was going to do it as a PowerPoint file and have you set it up as a slideshow and go through it. But I felt that was more work on your part. So I learned how to save it as a movie. And if you're ever interested, it's under file and export, in case you need to know that. However, there were complications there because there is a fixed setting for the slide time. Much inform so some slides that had too much information on them went too fast. So I had to split those into several slides, particularly the ones on citations and references. They still may be too fast, but as the trainee, you got instructions that you could pause it when necessary. And I'm hoping that you did. So when looking at what would work well for this set of employees, for you as students. I figured the, the familiarity with online presentations matched up well with having this PowerPoint movie. When thinking about what resources and other restrictions there were, I didn't want to make it too long and didn't want to go into too much detail of all the things I could point out about APA style. There are just way too many. So I chose the PowerPoint slideshow. And if you look at your book, at the various ways of describing different methods of training, this is considered web-based and off-site training. Once we have a training program put together, we need to test it. For testing the training, I needed to test out the training on the population I would be training. That is you as students. That I did, so I have to admit, this is something that I did um, incorrectly or not as high of quality as I could have. I only tested this on myself, which is not a good representation of students who would be taking the training. So, in essence, you all are my test, as well as my first group to be exposed to this. And besides, using others may be good as a first run through, but it will not come across all the issues that will come up until it's tested with the actual population that it's intended for.
So then the training was implemented. I posted the training as part of module six, 6.3, and made an announcement. You all clicked on the slideshow and hopefully watched and paused where you needed. This is where you were active participants or learners. So I wanna make some notes about this. Many features of this training were not standardized. If you think about it, when and where you viewed it could be different for different people. Some people could have seen the slideshow before completing assignment two. Others may have watched it after completing assignment two. How often and for how much time the presentation was paused is gonna differ from student to student. And how many times it was watched may be different from student to student. If I had the technology, and it's possible that I do, I don't know everything about Canvas, I could collect this information and use it in my statistical analyses to either control for or test these factors. For example, I could ask the question, did watching the slideshow more times increase its effectiveness? After training is implemented, then we need to evaluate the training program. So what was the purpose of the training? We need to look back at the goals. Did we achieve that? Hmm, this is a good question. Did we? How can we know if we did? We need an evaluation of some sort. There are different ways of looking and different levels of looking at training effectiveness. Kirkpatrick, back in 1959 and 60, published articles that talked about different levels, that talked about different levels of evaluating performance, of evaluating training published articles discussing different levels of evaluating training. At the initial or basic level is the reaction of trainees. What were their impressions? Did they like it? Did they feel like it was useful? Level two is learning. And this is testing that something has actually been learned and retained. Level three is behavior, transferring that training to the job and seeing if new behaviors are actually being shown, particularly the behaviors that were meant to be trained. And level four is that of results, whether the training had some impact on organizational outcomes. As you can see, this grows from a direct response to the training to longer term and more distal outcomes. So what will I look for in the evaluations? The reactionary criteria I had in the survey, things like, did you like the training? Did you feel like it was helpful? Will be something that I look at. But whether you feel like it was helpful doesn't tell me if it actually was. You may feel like you learned something, but make no changes in your behavior. So I need some learning criteria. How did people do on the sample that I asked you to correct and upload to the evaluation survey? And the nice thing about the way this is set up is we have some future assignments that will also be graded on APA formatting. So I can compare your behavior and implementing these, this new information to your future assignments. And then the results would be your grades. Now APA formatting is not a major component of your grades, so it's not going to have a huge impact on your overall class grade, but it may have 
an impact on your assignment grades. So does it matter if we know causality? I mentioned that causality does not matter so much for the selection of employees. If we know two things are related, we can predict one from the other, and we might not care why. In the case of selection, in many cases, it doesn't matter. If people who like watermelon make better pastry chefs, woohoo, hire them, with the caveat that we should make sure there isn't any adverse impact on subgroups. However, now we are talking about making changes to one part of a system. In this case, the employee. Knowing, causa knowing causality really does matter here. Anytime we want to have an impact and make changes on human behavior, we should have a sense of the causal direction of factors involved. Will helping people like watermelon more, perhaps through classical conditioning, make them better pastry chefs? We must know that the liking of watermelon causes the performance of a pastry chef. If not, we've wasted our time and resources, as well as that of the trainees. So yes, knowing that the training and not something else is causing any improvement in performance is important. And it's also useful to know what about training is causing improvement in performance, as this will prevent us from tweaking a training system and having a negative effect on its and having a negative effect on its effectiveness. So how do we know if training leads to results? Remember those research methods we talked about? I know you were hoping they were done and we wouldn't have anything to do with them anymore, but it's very important here. We understand causality through what kind of study? Through that true experimentation. However, how often is that actually possible in the real world, in a corporate setting? Not as much as we would like. So what's the next best thing? our quasi-experimental designs. If you remember, these are the study designs that look a lot like experiments because the researchers can and do manipulate one or more independent variables, but they cannot randomly assign people to conditions for one reason or another. If we are lucky, we can randomly assign groups. So it's close, but it's still not the same as randomly assigning individuals, which is what is necessary for it to be a true experiment. So back to our APA training. How do we know it wasn't something else that caused results? So say I find that the APA scores on the assignments after the APA training are significantly better than those before the training. How do I know it was the training slideshow that made the difference? What else could it be? Well, there are many other factors that could have had an impact. So let's say this is my evaluation design. And by the way, this is a pretty poor design for evaluating a study. And by the way, this is a pretty poor design for evaluating a training program. So I have training, I give it to everyone, and then I look at the results. Your surveys say you liked it, so yay, it was successful. I could also look at those samples and everyone did wonderfully and corrected them perfectly. But there are other things that could have had an impact. 
For example, feedback on the first assignment. I gave feedback to everyone to let them know what they did incorrectly. Using that feedback may have changed people's behavior in the future, gave them information to change how they did their citations and references. Maybe just doing it a second time, using APA format for a second time, or doing an assignment for me as an instructor. You could be learning from your group. You've also turned in a group assignment now. And during that group assignment may have discussed what was appropriate formatting. So these are all what we call confounding factors. These are all other possible causes of the results that we got in our study. And remember when we talked about different kinds of study design? This here is one type of quasi-experimental design. In particular, this study design is called a post-test only design. As you can see, there is a test after the training. There is nothing beforehand. This particular design is the least helpful quasi-experimental design in terms of telling us what happened. But it is better than collecting no data at all and not knowing where people stand after the training. At least here we can compare the results to the objectives or standards of performance that we have. So how could we design a better training evaluation study? One that would separate the effects of the training from those confounding factors. One of the most useful things we can do is to add a control group. So here we have an intervention group and we can take another class and have a control. Everything else is the same. They're getting their second and third assignments but there's no training slideshow that happens. And we can compare the results of these two different groups. So both groups would have the same experience other than the training intervention. So what makes this not a true experiment? If you look at these groups, there is no random assignment of individuals to the classes people have self-selected themselves into the classes. There may be experiences that the class has as a whole, as a group, that's gonna have an impact on the results. So because it is groups being assigned to either having the training or not, that makes this another example of a quasi-experimental design. This particular design is called non-equivalent control group design. These are pretty clever names, huh? They basically tell you what the design does. In this case, we have the group that gets the intervention and the group that serves as a control to compare it to. So the non-equivalent piece of this is that these groups are not the same. We may try to make them as similar as we can. Perhaps it's another 300 level psychology class, but it's not going to be the same. As I said, each class will experience its own events within that time period. Perhaps they might not even happen in the same semester. So we have the two groups that get the, so we have the group that gets the intervention and the group that serves as a control to compare it to. If simply getting feedback from the instructor or simply doing another similar assignment or learning from group members 
are factors that are causing the results to, to look relatively high, then both groups should have high scores. If the training itself has an effect, then only the intervention group will have significantly higher school scores than the control group. If the training itself has an effect, then the intervention group will have significantly higher scores than the control group. This will be the case even if both of them improve. So another option we have is to have only one group, but have a pretest before the training. And in essence, this is what I actually did because I can use that assignment one as the pretest. This pretest gives us a baseline performance for students. Then everyone gets the training slideshow. Afterward, afterwards, everyone takes a post test, which allows comparison to performance on the pretest. So you may or may not have noticed, I made some slight changes to the grades on the first assignment. Any change that I made only made the grade go up slightly. I adjusted the rubric scaling to match what it was meant to be originally and what all future assignments will now have. So now I'll be able to compare the scores from assignment one to assignment three and to assignment two. So this also is another quasi-experimental design. This one has the name pretest post test design. Clever again, huh? So we'll circle back to development. Once I have results of the training effectiveness from my multiple sources, which includes your ratings, your comments, APA samples from the training, and future assignment scores. Then I will have some idea of the strengths and weaknesses of the training. I can then go back to the training and fix problems to strengthen it for the next round. And then I'll do it all again. I'll evaluate and make changes again. So I want to acknowledge all of you for being my trainees as I tested out this training program for the first time. I hope it was useful and I do hope it was successful in changing behavior and having improved scores on your APA formatting on future assignments.